always better when we're together. All right, this morning we're going to talk about community, about who you, as a human being made in the image of God, are meant to be as a relational being, and about who we are meant to be as a community of interdependent, interrelated beings. This month, the uh, denominational magazine, The Banner, uh, published an article that I wrote on heaven on earth. There's 12 or so copies in the back if you want to get it, or you can Google it and look it up online. And in that article, um, I tried to write, and it's a bit of an imaginative exercise to imagine what heaven on earth is going to be like, admittedly, but a biblical vision of what reality will be like in a new heaven and new earth when God brings that to being in its fullness. I am a firm believer in the uh, idea of living with the end in mind. If you know what it's supposed to look like at the end, that has huge implications for how you live and what you choose to do and who you choose to be today. I also believe that how you live now when you get it right is a foretaste of that heaven on earth place. And so when you feel good or right or something true happening, uh, in particular relationally, that matters and that has a connection to something more eternal. And I also believe that right relational living can give you a real time now in your life mystical, powerful, mysterious experience of the presence of God. So in the article I write about work and the nature of the city and the architecture and all kinds of things, but regarding relationships, just one excerpt, I wrote this paragraph. The thought of what that new kind of world, new world, might be like fills me with awe and trembling. I imagine that every community experience in that heaven-on-earth place will have a sense of translucence to it. As I experience the love of another helping me, encouraging me, making me laugh, teaching me, I'll be able to see right through them to the God who is help, encouragement, laughter, and wisdom, to the God who made that other person. And, e and even as I do the same for another, support them, play a game with them, listen to them, I'll have a clear sense of the God of all support, play, and listening, doing all of these good actions through me. It'll feel like I'm co-loving with Christ, co-listening through Him, through God's Spirit. The whole moment will be saturated with triune communal love. Now, I'm trusting that you've experienced heaven-on-earth relational moments when you first set eyes on your daughter and everything was so perfect and she looking at you and you two looking at her, you bonded and that was so right and so true and so beautiful. When a friend texted you at just the right time when you were in a deep funk or confused or angry and encouraged or diffused or lifted you up and it was just perfect what they said and you fell into that very spacious and free place of actually depending on someone once in your life and it was so good or when you were with your partner and the intimacy and the love and the sense of trust and beauty was so palpable and real Surely we've all had heaven-on-earth relational moments. Who do you think authors those moments? Oh, I do. I make the choices, and so does this other person that I'm relating. Yeah. But in the bigger sense of everything, who authors those just right times? And what are they meant for? 
Are they just meant for the goodness and the beauty that you feel in the moment and have gifted to your life, or is there something more? Like I said earlier, I believe there's something more. We are all made in the image, in Christian circles, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a perfect community. And so to live relationally is to image the God who made you and to do it in out-of-this-world ways is to experience something of the ultimate relator. Which is why the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus to Christians in that early church and said this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. We're all called into relationships with others, with God, with our world. And do it this way. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Paul's making a couple of points there. Uh, the first one is rather obvious. If the same God, same Spirit, same baptism, same one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one God calls you and is working in your life and calls me and is working in my life, then we should be on the same page most of the time and be humble and gentle and loving like God is loving and never really argue or fight with each other. That's the math in the Christian church, and that's why Christian churches never have conflict over the history of Christianity. <laughs> why? Because I know that I'm a sinner, and how screwed up my motivations can be, and how selfish and egocentric I can be, and I'm sure sometimes you are the same, and so this spiritual relationship-breaking force of sin is at work. But I think there's another thing, and I haven't got this part figured out, but I, I think it's true. I think we miss something about how and when relationships are done right that could help us grow those types of experiences, true, right, beautiful relational moments. I think if we understood that God is somehow knowable when we do those good, right, relational things, if we have an experience of God in that place, it will deepen the significance of the moment. It will compel us to want to go there again and perhaps repeat those kinds of events more frequently. The last verse of that Ephesians passage, the second point that I'm picking up, reading it, where Paul says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over and through and in all. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is over and through and in all. God is over your life, through your life, and in your life. Whether you acknowledge it or not, it's true. When you acknowledge it, you know it's true. In another letter, the Apostle Paul writes, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. And then in another letter to another church, he writes, All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And the Him, He, is Jesus Christ who seems to be all over and around everything, including the discussion you're going to have with your husband after church or with your son or with your spouse or with your mom, your kids. 
So, what does this mean, this overthrow and inness of Christ, this from, through, and to-ness of all created reality, this through and forness of all our relational capacities? I was going to cut that whole paragraph off, but I just thought it was cute, but it really is more confusing than cute. But what does it mean that God is all over your relationships? I guess the first thing it means is that What's good when you experience it comes from Him and is a gift. A gift that is built into your human nature at creation and a gift that is authored by the Spirit that in Christian circles we believe is attending to everything in our lives, authoring all truth and goodness. And both, it's always both. So a just-in-time spirit around your life and then some innate capacities that God meant for you to be and live, working together to make those great relational moments. So the question then is, if Christ is all over your life in all of these ways, all the time, can you know Him? God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the doing, in the relating. I sometimes meet people I totally dislike. And, you know, when I was a developer, I could just be an ass about it. <laughs> Not really. But as a pastor, you, you got to mostly just be an ass about it on the inside. <laughs> a jerk. So I'm in a conversation with someone I don't like, and they're doing stuff I don't like. And I think, come on, John, quit being such a judgmental jerk and listen. And in the best of those times, and it just happened a couple weeks ago, I, ha- I undergo a conversion. And all of a sudden, I listen through different ears. My heart seems to soften. I look into the person's eyes and see their very human image-bearing being, and a love kind of grows within me for that person, and I listen differently, and what they have to say matters, and I see their needs and their wants and what they're trying to express and respond in kind. I used to think that was just my Calvinist work ethic guilt conscience at work that led to that conversion. But this week I thought, who made your conscience, John? According to the Apostle Paul again, God did. In Romans 2 he wrote, God's law is not something alien imposed on us from without, God's law, His way of being, of living, it's woven into the very fabric of our creation. There's something deep within us that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. So every time my conscience pricks me and you save me, and you save a relational moment, a relationship with another person, I ought to be thankful, God, because you gave me that life regulator. There's a voice in behind that little voice, in behind all those cognitive processes that no philosopher can really understand, but in our circles, we claim we know that voice by name. As freely as you are giving something or serving something to someone else, you've been gifted and served by God. I do this math often when I, and best in my life when I forgive people. Um, you hold a grudge, you're angry, you're mad, sometimes for a way too long a time, and then it gets to the point where you're able to extend forgiveness to that person. And in me, anyway, it often goes like this, you know. I don't ever have to forgive Heather, but say I'm mad at Heather, and Heather's mad at me, and I want to forgive. i got to let go of something, right? We've talked about it now, John. you got to let go of it. 
And often the letting go moment and the freedom of that is surrounded by a sense, I've got to keep my head in the game here, surrounded by this sense of having already been forgiven by God at another point in my life, alongside this great sense of God forgiving me for being such a jerk, for holding on to the grudge for so long. And my heart for Heather is surrounded by the heart of God, and the heart of God is surrounding both of us, and as I'm extending forgiveness to her, it's like God is extending forgiveness to her through me, and as she's receiving it, I'm receiving forgiveness from God, and all of the forgivenesses become commingled and interdependent. And it is, you know, when you, when you, what, whatever you say on earth that will be done in heaven, it is when it, there is something about doing the right thing relationally here when you let someone else go that has eternal implications. And in the best of those moments, I know God forgiving through me. And I think that sense of God's Christ's presence in a relational moment like forgiveness is meant to happen when you listen. When you listen in a way that is Christ-like, He'll know it by the way you maintain eye contact, by the way you nod at all the right times, by the way you are taking in your spouse's burden, your friend's concerns. In the way we notice, in the way we laugh together, I think we're meant to experience God in all of those places. The Apostle Paul again. Watch what God does, and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents, Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with Him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us but to give everything of Himself to us. Love like that. Now imagine your life in every relational moment being fueled by that love and through how you choose to relate, um, giving you a foretaste of, an experience of the love of God. Every moment. I mean, that would be heaven on earth, and none of us gets that right. But imagine just even stringing a couple of great relational moments together that are heaven-like in that way. We change, you change your life. You'd never want to stop experiencing God in those places. You would be inspired to know God more and more and more and more of your relational life. And empowered, we as a community could change a whole city if we actually lived out of His powerful presence in that place. And we would change something. Knowing God is not just a personal between you and God just for the sake of knowing things, although there are things and parts of me that go, that's all there is, and that's more than enough. And And it's true, but to know God is to be transformed into a change agent in your relationships and in your relationship with the rest of the world, and to then get on with transforming that world. It's a knowing that goes somewhere, first into a more Christ-like life. Christ through you being a mom, being a wife. And second, through you to your world. 
making Calgary, our world, a more heaven-on-earth place, feeding orphans in Malawi, changing the world for a whole bunch of kids and families that this little church in Calgary is connected to there. You know, within our community, growing our kids into a real, alive relationship with God here at New Hope. Bringing this idea of God speaking in the world and speaking in the Bible, this gift, this gift that He's given us to the larger church. And somehow through it all, knowing Him more because he weeps for orphans in Malawi and cares deeply about the eternal nature and soul of our city and wants you to know him more and more and more all the time. So, there is no such thing as a mere relationship. or an insignificant conversation, or an inconsequential interaction with another human being. Not when you believe in a God who is over and through and before and beside and in all things. Not if you believe that everything is from God and for God. Not if you believe in God If we had God's eyes for other people, C.S. Lewis said, we would be tempted to fall on our knees and worship them for the glory that resides there. Everything from Him and in Him and through Him. One more quote from Paul, this time to the Roman church. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, uh, make this idea of uh, knowing you, really knowing you, through... uh, through an event in life where we are forgiven, through the experience of your out-of-this-world love, through a moment of such profound beauty and grandeur that we just know that you're there and that you must be in this world. Through a song, a great book, through reading a psalm or a word, 2,000-year-old word from a letter written by an early church apostle. Speak in a way and move by your Spirit in a way so that we can receive from you what we are meant to receive, and then out of that restored and being restored relationship, speak differently and listen differently and love differently in our world. And as we partake in communion now, make your presence very, very real to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.